Uh, well, here's my official intro then. Uh, <laughs> my name is Perjan. I'm the maker of Canopio and super delighted. Uh, me and the rest of the Canopio community uh, is here to talk to Sean. Um, and Sean is a creative technologist, designer, and developer, uh, and a teacher uh, at the Poex School of Computation and a graphics editor at the New York Times. Um, he's used Canopio for teaching uh, and also for giving talks. Uh, and we're going to talk to him about uh, how he sees creative coding and how he uses Canopio uh, and just questions about teaching. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Um, there's a previous talk that I kind of referenced um, in the, there's a Canopio Swiss associated with this talk. Uh, however we package this up, there will be a link to it in the description or whatever. Um, and so there's a previous talk that Sean did with Glitch in 2022, and uh, it kind of goes over a lot of what his background is. But um, I guess briefly, Sean, uh, if you could introduce yourself and, and kind of, yeah. Uh, talk about that or uh, talk about how you kind of got into creative coding and teaching. Uh, that'd be pretty cool. And I'll take notes in the space as well as we go. Yeah, and for so sure. can anyone else. Cool. Cool. Thanks for the intro. Um, no problem. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My name is Sean Katangi. Um, oh, I'd say, uh, the, the questions were the background, creative coding, teaching. Uh, were those are three ones. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, as Prashant said, uh, I'm a designer and developer um, at the New York Times currently, but, you know, history of working freelance and doing all, all kinds of different things. Um, uh, outside of uh, making things on the computer, I would say my main interests are uh, basketball and, and playing music. And most, li most recently, it's been a piano. So those are, those are my, my two non-screen activities I try to do uh, most days. Um, but on screen, um, uh, creative coding. Yeah, that, I, I would say yeah, creative coding was is the driving force between uh, behind all of the things I've been able to do in my career. Um, so <laughs> it's funny, like creative coding. I got into it literally just on Hacker News. <laughs> um, uh, I, I think it was in like my junior year of, of college um, at University of uh, North Carolina Chapel Hill. Um, I was studying math, uh, and I just was browsing Hacker News, and I saw uh, 2JS, 2.js on the front page one day. Um, and 2JS is a is a like a, a drawing uh, framework uh, by by John O'Brandel, um, and it's I had I had no idea what this meant at the time, but it was renderer agnostic, so write one one set of like one one program uh, and it can render in canvas or in svg or webgl but i had no idea what what that meant at the time i was just like oh you can write code and make shapes um you know i was i was like struggling to learn my like stumble through illustrator at the time um and as someone who had a little bit of coding background like I was like there's got to be a better way um and so <laughs> yeah so i was i was like, trying to learn the adobe suite at the time but um this this framework that I saw on Hacker News really really caught my eye, especially because um, uh, John O'Brandel's um, uh, aesthetic was so graphical and cartoony yet sophisticated, um, and it really appealed to me. Um, yeah, so was the I, interaction <laughs> interactive possibilities of like two DS versus like you know your typical Adobe product kind of part of the draw? Oh, for sure. Yeah, definitely the interactive part. Um, maybe in, in maybe like an immature sense, I was like, it has to be code, it has to be like intellectual, like, I don't like, I want to do the hard, do it the hard way. But, <laughs> um, but it, um, after I like, I, I stumbled through trying to get it to run, I had no idea how to run a web page locally. Um, and I had tried and gave up several times. Um, but finally, I, I figured out how to <laughs> get HTML, CSS and JavaScript uh, to talk to each other. Um, yeah, I, I made, I made these like very minimal modern compositions and I would, I would randomize the composition with, with uh, just like the math.random, like position this circle, like on the left half of the screen, if math.random is less than 0.5, um, like very simple stuff. But I, I think I was, I was I was thinking very existentially at the time, as one does in, in college. Um, and I, mm -hmm. for some reason, I just, I felt so much meaning um, in the way that every refresh um, 
was something new um, and unique and pretty like unlikely to occur ever again. Um, at least that's how, how I conceived of it. So um, yeah, interactivity, but just like the, the sheer um, uniqueness and, and scale of, of how, how every composition could be a little bit different. I think that was what really, really caught my eye because I, I felt like when I was doing things in Illustrator, I was always trying to replicate, replicate that, um, that the quote unquote yeah, error. I think error. Yeah. I think that kind of speaks to a kind of the different eras in which we both went to school. So me being probably a lot older, um, there was no 2JS. Um, animation on the web was very primitive. Um, I think we just had transitions um, for basic things, but even then that was like a bleeding edge feature. Um, so for me, the web, like the initial web site or the web world was make a blog, make your own personal website. And Illustrator actually was the backbone of, of what I did too. And so for me, the challenge was uh, with the different constraints that I had was how do I make a website look like how I made it in Illustrator? How do I express ideas and drawings that I made in Illustrator and kind of bring that into the web with the, the limitations of the medium as it were? Uh, so it's kind of cool that we both kind of started from Illustrator and, uh, you know, found different ways to kind of express that. Sure. Um, yeah, so I guess jumping forward a little bit, um, how does that take you to, uh, I guess, your current practice of, you know, um, design development um, and teaching? Oh, yeah. So teaching, uh, teaching is something I always um, drawn to. Um, I think, you know, I never felt like, super comfortable in school and I always felt like I had to like, shift the way I was thinking about something or like really talk myself through something to, to understand it. Um, so I, yeah, I, I just had a motivation to um, just understand the, the, the concept of learning um, for myself, but then it slowly grew into just like, oh, like other people, everyone's different and they need to hear it in different ways. So I thought that was always um, something interesting to um, to dedicate your life to, um, yeah, very, very fulfilling. Um, the, um, so it was, and, and this was also happening in parallel to like me trying to pretend to be a designer and like convince people like, like, let me do your website, let me do a logo. Um, uh, but so much of that job is, is educating people on, on what you do and what your value is. Like it's, 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 you know, you, you can, you can look at it as a way of like, I need to, do the flashiest thing and and talk about what I'm doing in the most like obscure terms, or you can take it as an opportunity to um, like, rather than ju justify your your cost, um, you can take it as an opportunity to show people like oh like you're you're paying me because this thing that you're asking me to do is actually pretty complicated, um, so um, I need to get this answer from you. I need to to f figure out what your priority are because this can go a lot of different ways so it's like kind of a, a way of, of teaching people how you think but also you know it just you know, designers have have very often had to just explain their whole industry um, at, at the start of any client relationship um, so that was that's that's kind of where the the, the two things overlap um, but there was there was one moment where um, you know design and, and teaching um, didn't didn't happen over like a computer product. Um, my first job out of college was um, selling furniture and decorating apartments. Um, so uh, I lived in Washington, D.C. Um, with with my cousin. Um, I just had had no plans or like idea what to do. Um, and so I just like walked into a furniture store and, and said like hey can i can i have a job and some of so for some reason they they asked me <laughs> they, they they asked me in for an interview and I, and I and i got the job um but that was also another another um did you find so like, furniture was like that too where you know the difference between one table and another is up to you to educate about what what the distinction is and why one may be more expensive than another or maybe why you should you know uh ball out on this one table yeah, for sure. It was, it's definitely like teaching people like how to, like helping people see like all these, these are all the ways that you interact with this piece of furniture. Like, oh, this couch, do you, do you, do you like to sit on the armrest? Do you like to sit, lean on the back of it? Or like, 
like maybe you want a glass table, um, a glass tabletop because yeah. you you want to accentuate the light um, in the apartment. Um, th things like that. Um, it's and actually like, interesting because it sounds like education and selling, like they're they're very kind of closely connected, like functionally, but also the way you do it. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, for example, like, you know, you mentioned uh, being a designer and having to educate people about your value, but another way to interpret that is uh, being a designer means selling your ideas. Um, and I think that's much like a lot of people that are new to design think, oh, you know, design is making the mock-ups and making a pretty, pretty concept. Um, but the hard part, that's the easy part. The hard part is convincing other people that this idea makes sense and why we should do it. And working within, you know, constraints and stuff that, that customers or other people might have. And yeah, I see a lot of overlap with, uh, selling furniture there. So that's pretty cool. For sure. It's like, you know, maybe, maybe it is worth a, a couple hundred dollars to be able to like lean on the back of your couch <laughs> uh, when you're yeah, not on, like, on the opposite side of it. Um, but in, to, in that case, like it helps to, to ask people like, hey, what are you going to use this couch for? Um, mm. And them hearing that you're kind of interested in how they use it makes your recommendation a lot stronger, I think, too. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, so that, so that's my that's my whole my furniture my whole furniture detour um but so at the <laughs> at the uh at the time um you know i i was, I was just like fresh out of school i was still um so the way it, it leads me to creative coding is um or like fully fully creative coding and, and teaching in school for poetic computation is um, um i volunteered um to um, help out at the aiga conference um 2017 um and so yeah i was able to to attend the conference and and there is where i saw uh, zach lieberman zach lieberman was giving a talk um and i had i had no idea who he was i had no idea that creative coding was this big thing beyond this niche like 2js uh, framework i had no idea how big the world was um but seeing zach lieberman off, off, up on the stage and coding in real time and open frameworks um i was like this these are these are my people um and so like i don't know and probably after after his talk i probably like pestered him with questions and like was probably like way too intense um but you know I, yeah i looked into it and and saw like oh they school for poetic comput computation they accept applications and all that and so yeah i went went back to dc and before my before my my shifts at the furniture store i would i would just be working on my like working on those like math.random compositions and just seeing like, oh, like, oh, I can add transitions to this. Oh, I can layer and, and mask or, and I can do all these things um, that, you know, we're, we're possible in Illustrator, but like, okay, I need to do this because it's interactive and the school for poetic computation is like, you know, thinking about the materiality of, of the code itself. Um, and so yeah, that, that's, that's maybe like a few month long period where you know I'm working on this application to SFPC and just really trying to get a grasp on okay I have this skill of coding I studied math and it's not I don't want to go into like into like finance um I just just reconfiguring all the things that I learned um along the way and yeah uh it pretty Did cleanly you, fit into this SFPC container. I find making Canopio like math is the thing that I like learned to love. Uh, didn't have that much love. Even working at Glitch, it was just sort of like, oh, I got to do math, like, or I got to do something like vaguely numerical. Let's hope Stack Overflow has a canned answer for me. Um, yeah. uh, but it, there's like, a, there's like a joy in optimizing something, you know, making it a little faster, finding like hacks to like, you know, like lookup tables versus, you know, computing things live, uh, little tricks like that. Um, and yeah, I'm wondering if when you, when you, your motivation to, to take math was kind of connected to some of those ideas that you might've had early on. Mm. Hmm. I, I feel like every, anything I'm going to say is going to be like post rationalizing it. Um, of course. but, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, at the time, I think I just felt like, yeah, I was thinking very existentially, but I, I think felt gravitated towards math because it just felt pure or, or like it, pure in the sense that i don't know what That's i want to do um oh. I, like i don't i don't know what i want to do and so like let me just grasp onto the thing that is yeah like you said true um mm -hmm. then you know it, i can apply it upwards um from from the foundation of like human thought um 
in theory, <laughs> uh, but you know, I didn't, I didn't really have a smooth on ramp onto any anything else, um, but creative coding. Um, so that's the kind of the the way I was thinking about it, um, and you know, I was when I when I think about you know studying math today, I'm like, I, I always think back to my senior year where like. Like, I wish I worked with a number. Like, <laughs> like, it, like the math at that point was like no numbers at all. It was just like letters and, and like Greek symbols. Um, and so, yeah, but, math, but I, I, really, I really value that. I still that. don't get it. Mm. Yeah. Like, but I, every I, time I, I really see math notation, I'm just like, like, what are these symbols? And they're not defined in line like you'd expect from a variable where like, yeah. you know, you'd say X equals blah, blah, blah before you start the whole thing. Uh, but a lot of times X is just an assumed, or there's like special letters that mean assumed constants for people in the know, uh, which is, yeah, I feel like, I wonder if mathematical notation would be different if it was developed, initially developed in the era of the keyboard and computers, because, yeah. I mean, people who write things in latex and whatever, it does feel a lot of times like fitting a square peg in a round hole. Absolutely. And I think it scares a lot of people off too, just because it's like, I've never seen anything like this before. I, I, I had some classmates do their homework in in latex and like, oh, you know, that's that's hardcore. I can I can yeah, never. Super <laughs> um, kind of relatedly, like maybe I know, I'm sure there are a lot of people in creative technology or interested in creative technology that maybe don't have a math background or maybe they do, but they're wondering where they should start. And I'm wondering if you have like a words like a recommendation of where you should start uh, if you're into that world. Or you see something um, cool on the web and you're like, how do they make that animate and make cool sound effects and stuff? Mm, yeah, I've, I feel like um, there's a, probably like dozens of books about just like the basic math of, of game mechanics. And I would say that that'll give you, that'll get you like 90% of the way there. Um, and I think the, the, the big, big piece of that is just like vector math. Um, and then maybe like know, some trig stuff, like thinking about things rotationally. Um, and then I guess, yeah, it would definitely help to, I, I don't have this down, but it would definitely help to, to really understand Bezier curves and like how their parameters work out. Um, I feel like you've got a good grasp on it since, since, uh, Canopio has, has all these, these curves connecting all the, connecting all the It does, through. but for me, it wasn't, um, like front loaded knowledge. It was stumbling around and being like, how do I make the curve? Like, how do I make the line be a curve? And then yeah. figuring out, hey, there's a word called Bezier and, you know, uh, quadratics and whatever. Um, and then doing very much the minimum. Like, the curve in Canopio is just an endpoint, a start point, and then a fixed control point that's not currently dynamic because uh, I found that using this middle ground value just worked and it meant less math that I had to do in the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of, like, little shortcuts and hacks like that, and I kind of fill it in with, with knowledge over time as I gain it, I guess. That's the way to do it. Like, you know, my math experience was a four-year degree, but it's, it's lifelong. Um, I think, you know, be, have, having fluency and just being able to, like, step into the mindset of, of like, okay, I'm reading a math paper. Um, I think that's, that, that helps. Um, I think one of the, one of the best things that a professor said to me, uh, cause I was, I was like struggling immensely and I was like scared to go to office hours cause I was just, I, I thought I was going to get yelled at for not, <laughs> for not understanding anything. Um, but yeah, uh, he was very reassuring, um, and said like, it's not about being smart. It's about being organized. And I thought that 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 has really stuck with me. Um, is like whenever I feel like some you know something is very overwhelming, this this this, this bug I can't figure out. Um, I, I I try to remember that and say like, okay, I just need to group all the things that I know are true into like buckets, uh, <laughs> arrange them in Canopio. <laughs> like honestly, um, it's like I know this to be true. I know this to be true, and then I just need to figure out like where to plug the connections. Um, to be able to, to solve the problem. And, you know, it, it might not be math, like, technically, but I feel like that's uh, spiritually math. <laughs> interesting. Yeah, it's a, that's kind of an interesting take on it. And actually, I guess that kind of segues us up into how you discover and use Canopio. Like, how did you first find Canopio? I know you used Glitch before this. Yeah, I, I honestly think I saw it from your Twitter, um, or, or maybe, maybe a blog post. Um, and, yeah, it... Like, I don't think I had to, I don't, I don't think I needed any convincing <laughs> on, on like why I should use it. Um, yeah, it just, it just felt right. Um, and I think, 
know, that that kind of you know, it kind of it kind of like sits in line with the teaching thing of like I, I I need to figure out a way for me to feel like this is true like this this concept that I'm I'm trying to trying to grasp um, so like. Yeah, it just it just felt like being able to arrange things spatially, um, non-linearly, um, just felt like yeah, it feels it felt most in line with like like doing my homework and taking notes um, because you know I I would always prefer um, I would always prefer like just blank no rule no graph lines no dots paper um, I would yeah I would just <laughs> I would just take take paper out of the printer and like that that would be be my my notebook um because any 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 other structure felt like a little too restricting or i was i was thinking about organizing my work too much and then i wasn't i wasn't thinking um so yeah i think i think canopia just felt like the um the the closest digital analog and yeah and it just it was like okay this is cool it's like my paper but i don't have to erase <laughs> um that 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 yeah, was basically it, it. <laughs> It kind of occurred to me like that was kind of like the real competitor, I guess, or like um, tentpole is how do I make a tool that's at least as expressive or more expressive than paper, but with all the digital little advantages of, you know, you can view it on your phone, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you can share it with other people. Um, and, you know, I think I think like the traditional thing to do when you're competing with or wanting to make something that evokes paper is to make it look like paper and I guess skeuomorphism is the word um, where you know like you'll have like a little pen uh, icon and maybe when you type it makes a scratching sound like parchment on or a quill on parchment or something like that um, but yeah I often feel like it's kind of the wrong way to go because it, it kind of you're tying the function with the with an aesthetic that I guess doesn't necessarily fit um, like paper looks like paper for a reason because it, it needs to be and the digital thing can look like whatever it, it needs to be as well uh, and making yeah making things look like physical things um and they and when they yeah what's the word i'm looking for um when the function and the form don't really like line up together it just feels weird to me like it feels like oh this is a trendy thing it's cool right now but i'm going to be sick of it really soon uh because if i want to use something that look like paper i just use paper mm. And there are so many advantages, uh, you know, through like crazy interactions um, in the digital world that I think, yeah, paper can't do. And uh, we should, uh, you know, embrace that. Yeah, All the creative sure. technology, um, data viz, graphics, animation, all that stuff is just so compelling. And it's kind of not that used in conventional apps. Like it just feels like everyone's got the same tail scale, tailwind bootstrap template situation mm. going on um and that's great because at least it kind of works um but it just seems like there's so much more we could be doing as an industry yeah for sure and i i, I really like um, um i really like that you that you bring up like you know it just looks different like it just it just looks different from a tailwind bootstrap thing um that's kind of, kind of that was partially my motivation for you know making a talk in canopio um but also like teaching my class um with canopio because i my 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 talk was like during the work day and my my class was at the end of a like a wednesday so everyone's everyone's been, been looking at a google doc um all day uh, everyone's been looking at like like you know these these linear interfaces all day and so i i, I think it m makes a really big difference to just step into a space that that feels new and novel um it's like what, what's that what's that one one meme uh, it's like during the pandemic was like i can't wait to to stop looking at bad screen and go home and like look at look at good screen <laughs> um like like it was just, it's like all the same but it's like <laughs> yeah but but i i, I feel like um, you know, going from a, a Google Docs or a Notion into Canopio, um, like when I when I wanted to step into like an art space and, th and think deeply, like it really made a big difference. Um, and you know, the the like the the, the almost like a full game mechanic kind of stuff, like with the with the draw and then just like seeing people's like smiley faces move around. I think it's just it it really it really makes a big difference for for people. Um, Feeling like they're they're a digital space together, but in a digital space that is prioritizing um, like something different than what their corporate <laughs> corporate overlords are, are requiring of them. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, that makes sense. I mean, speaking of corporate overlords, I guess that also leads me into another question. Uh, I'm wondering if you've ever kind of thought um, or you have opinions on the relationship between commerce and technology. Like, you know, it seems like this is not exclusive to the technology industry, but like you've got a lot of practitioners on the ground um, and artists, um, you know, kind of pushing boundaries. And then you have people who kind of walk that that trodden path and turn it into a product and, you know, get VC funding and whatever, um, you know, combining frameworks to make uh, to make the newest revolution in AI drawing apps or whatever. Um, yeah, and I'm wondering if you you ever you ever think about like, what should that relationship actually be or, or whatever? Yeah, I won't lead you in with it. Yeah, um, I, I will say I saw this question in the Canopio like before we started, and I was like, scared of this question because it's it's a really big it's a really big one. Um, but I, I do try and, and touch on it during, um, like in, in my class. Um, I shared two articles. Um, one was um, a, a blog post by Robin Sloan um, called "An App Can Be a Home Cooked Meal." Um, it's one of one of my favorite favorite articles, um, in which you know Robin Sloan talks about how. They made an app that was just for their family and it's gonna gonna live in like test flight um on their mm-hmm. phones like forever um and yeah it was like kind of like a social media but just for for them um just for their family and i thought that was that was beautiful and the, it, there was a great observation of um great observation of uh was they, they, yeah they said like um he's a the the home cooking equivalent of a of a programmer or the programming equivalent of a home cook um like yeah i i I need to know how to cook to like sustain myself and you know i can get into the art of it sometimes and sometimes i can just make it a small meal um yeah and i i loved that you know can be the programming equivalent of that um because i think you know when you go to school and, and step into these computer science department halls it's full of people who want to get rich <laughs> like yeah um, like I, I remember like in like a beginner comp sci class like there's there's a tensions of like business school people who are just like out there socializing and like oh i want to i need to find someone to to build my idea and, and make a bunch of money um and like that that dynamic is is very very per- pervasive especially like you know the hackathons where companies come and just throw money at kids um maybe not so much anymore um, <laughs> given the economy but you know at around like 2000 like early 2010s like that was that was a really really big dynamic um, yeah, it reminds so it me of a, a Twitter take that I heard about AI being like, um, finally, I can be an idea person, like a prompt <laughs> engineer, essentially, where it's like, make me an app. And, you know, yeah, I've, yeah. I've skipped the whole having to find a developer thing, um, oh, man. which is kind of <laughs> interesting because I think, yeah, that idea just never goes away. Uh, if I yeah. have the idea, then you just make it and it'll be great because of me. Um, but actually, yeah. um, Re just posted, um, when you mentioned the program equipment of a home cook, she mentioned Kenji Alt Lopez, um, who's a YouTube cook food reviewer guy. But I think his, his jobby job, his day job is like, he's a professional chef or a restaurant owner. And I think what he does is like, there's a distinction between the food you cook, you know, for your restaurant guests and the food you cook at home. Uh, totally in terms of like the formality of it and you know the amount of butter and lunch and things like that um yeah i I can kind of see that equivalent especially if you you have like a job doing um development and then you make cool side projects at home yeah absolutely i i so happy that kenji lopez all got brought up because that like my my youtube content is entirely like basketball and then like (laughs) jazz theory and then kenji lopez alt like that is that is the entirety of my youtube um and i love i love kenji lopez alt because like the way yeah because clearly he has like so much knowledge about about cooking but i i i, I really admire the way that he he goes out of his way to say this thing that i'm doing doesn't matter or like you can do it like 12 different ways or like this is the way you're supposed to do it but since i'm at home like since i'm at home i'm not going to do this and, I, and at the end of the day i don't care um i i, I just love that dynamic because you know it, it, cooking cooking can have this dynamic and programming can have this dynamic of like there's there's this language um that you know you can use to make 
non cooks, non programmers feel like feel like ostracized. Um, but at the end of the day, they're very like they're very accessible tasks that can make you feel empowered um, in in your day to day life. Um, uh, and so I, I I really appreciate when someone who's like so knowledgeable um, goes out of their way to you know not take themselves too seriously. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's really great at that, um, like lowering that formality barrier, I guess. Mm. And yeah, that's that's pretty cool. Um, I also remember seeing on your talk that you gave um, that um, you quoted Vera Molmar. I hope I didn't pronounce that wrong, but she, uh, she said randomness or they said randomness helps us find the exact thing we like, widening and accelerating and accelerating the exploration process. And I'm wondering, um, what is, I know like randomness is a big part of creative coding. The, the idea of like, you know, like, um, you put, you might click the exact same place. Um, two people might click on the exact same place, but get totally different outputs just because of how the program's designed. And, you know, there's a lot of like spontaneity and, um, yeah, cool discovery that comes from that. Um, and I'm wondering how randomness, like with a, someone with a formal math background, how do you think of randomness? Is it? It might be, I suspect it might be distinct from how the rest of us do. Oh, um, I don't know. I don't know if it's too distinct. Um, yeah. Like, is it an art thing? Like, what do you think of when you first think of randomness? Like, I think the reason why I thought it might have been different is because I think when the average person thinks of randomness, they think of negative things like chaos and... Um, like mm -hmm. lack of control, um, but uh, in the creative coding context, if that's like you, the world you live in, randomness is like another, it's like a paintbrush. It's another tool in the tool chest, essentially. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, I feel like I do look at it as, as like a lack of control and kind of chaos, but I, I, I think I, I see those as um, pretty positive things. Um, like, think, you know, the randomness, like I, I find, I find that whenever I'm trying to make art, um, overthinking is is absolutely the way that I'm going to derail my my process. And so I think randomness and relinquishing that control um, is, is a excellent tool um, for just moving me moving moving me forward a bit. Um, so like I don't know if I'm if I'm like splitting hairs on where something should be placed. Um, I, I I think I think that making making something random um, kind of bakes subjectivity into it of like you know this this output might be beautiful to someone and it might not be beautiful to someone else. Um, I think you know I think the way that we talk about a lot of art and try to like mythologize a lot of art and artists is that um, it's they we, we like to talk about artists and their work as inevitable. Um, but I, I think, think, uh, yeah, building random into it, uh, really, and gets at, gets at the process of creating it a little bit more. Like, it, it just happened, um, and, and it wasn't me. And I think uh, that positions, you know, me as an artist, uh, maybe in a in more of a position of humility. Um, that like, it like, it. I'm just. Uh, I was just here to witness it and and say like, oh, this is cool. Um, rather than me choosing the exact like position of, of some asset. Yeah, in a way, kind of, because it blurs that line between I'm the creator of this thing and I'm also a consumer of it, uh, it kind of, maybe you could say it encourages like a sort of empathy, like you're, puts you more in the eye of a, of a viewer of it rather than I'm like the god master creator of this one fixed canvas. Yeah, for sure. And it's, and it's like, um, uh, there are plenty of like, anecdotes of like uh, like jazz players and like in their solos they're like oh that was a mistake like i had i had no intention to do that but that is what got um like solidified into <laughs> into like pop culture uh because that was all that was that's what happened in the recording session um and so like i, I think i think it's it's nice to introduce kind of things like that um that mimic that like improvisational unpredictability yeah yeah, jazz is a pretty is a is a yeah. I can see the the relationship there in retrospect. That's pretty cool. Um, I guess uh, moving on. Um, let's see. So, aside from Canopio, um, what are your favorite tools for teaching in daily life? Cool and teaching. Okay. Um, 
I would say in daily life, um, I really like the IA writer. Um, I get to. Yeah, yeah. It's I, I it took me a long time to find something that I liked better than text edit. Um, but IA writer, <laughs> <laughs> IA writer uh, uh, fit the bill. And so yeah, I've been using IA like. You, I, I used to use it for to-do lists of like, literally I would just write everything in a list and then I would like kind of comment it out, <laughs> uh, things when I got, mm. got it done. Um, so I was using it like that for a long time, but I think that the, the way that it's really stuck with me is I've, I've been keeping a, keeping a journal um, for uh, maybe almost, almost 10 years now in IA. Um, so yeah, I have I don't know, just there's hundreds of entries, um, and so it's just yeah, it feels like it feels like part of my of my thinking process um, to open IA um, and just talk through talk through something um, with myself. Um, so that that's that's been yeah, that's been something that's been close to me. Another when app you, that oh god, oh sorry, just a quick IA question because I use it too, but I probably use it differently than you. It sounds like, but when you open IA, do you like read your old stuff or? Or is it just, I know when you open IA by default, it's like, here's a blank page, start writing. Uh, maybe that can be configured. Um, but yeah, I'm wondering if you, you mentioned uh, keeping a journal in IA, is, is the review stage like really important to you? Um, it's scary to me. Um, I've done it, I've, I've, I've gone back and read entries maybe like twice um, in my life. Um, one time I was like, damn, I was like really sad. <laughs> like I would open IA, I would open IA when I'm kind of spiraling and just like, just, just get it all out there. But it was, you know, reading it, I was like, this isn't helping. Like <laughs> you should just like talk to someone. Um, so like there, there's, there was that dynamic. Um, and then another time, you know, I, I maybe in a bit of a better headspace, I, I would read and like, oh, I, I would read the same things. Like, oh, I have, I have empathy for this person. Um, like, yeah, it's it's uh, really yeah. I, I think I, the last time I, I reread stuff was um, at the end of a relationship, um, and it was you know of course it was like a it was like sad to break up, but I think um, it was it was really awesome to have have that there to reflect and yeah share maybe maybe share some of the entries with people and just remark it at, yeah you know, how things i'm like that too like i only journal when it's like bad things i find like when i'm having a good day i'm just like the last thing i want to do is write about it it's right right i'm trying to get better at that i'm trying to good i'm habit. trying to like yeah. write like right i'm i'm really happy right now and it, it can just be short and sweet <laughs> nice <laughs> maybe maybe when you journal when you're happy like it I would maybe um, it becomes closer to scrapbooking where it's like you're like cool pancakes I ate today and other yeah. things like that that may be more image oriented. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I feel like uh, um, yeah, my the the iPhone like photos widget maybe is, is kind of doing that a little bit, resurfacing oh, yeah. uh, random random memories. Um, yeah. I, so like, another another app that I've been. Um, I've I've had for a really long time, uh, but my use of it has changed. is a is a metronome. Um, so I, I talked about like kind of being big into music, um, uh, and so yeah, of course, of course, like it was the, it was the first app that I that I bought with my own money. Um, that like okay, I need to get like a really like nice high quality metronome app, um, and I got it on my like iPhone four, and it's, it's now it's on my <laughs> iPhone thirteen, um, but uh, so like. Of course, you know, it has this normal like music applications of just like practicing and being in time. Um, but these days, um, it's it's actually displaced uh, headspace for me. Um, I, so I, I used to I used to do meditation with with headspace a lot, but I found that like a voice talking to me um, ended up being a little bit uh, more distracting and kind of um, I took my attention off of uh, meditating. Or yeah, yeah, just just felt felt contrary to to what I wanted to get out of it. Um, so yeah, I, I now I just kind of have like as it metronome metronome sounds um, to mark the time. I set it to sixty beats per minute, so it's like one second. Okay, so I have like four seconds in, hold for four seconds, and then you know like breathe out for eight seconds or like whatever configuration that I that I want. Um, 
yeah, so it's, <laughs> it's strangely, uh, my metronome app has, has turned into a, a meditation app. Um, for, That's for really cool. It, it almost feels like you've graduated from Headspace. Like, I, I can imagine <laughs> when you're new to meditation, you need a lot of prompting and, you know, people telling you when to breathe and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, now that that stuff is, that's just training wheels and now you're full on metronome, which is super cool. Mm. I, I, I've actually, I've, I've actually kind of pair it sometimes. I do. There's another meditation app called State. Um, that's a pretty minimal, um, pretty minimal app. Um, but I, I still find that the metronome allows me to be as flexible as I want, and if and just yeah, just configure it exactly to to what I need at the moment. Yeah, that's that's super cool. I guess we have a, a lot of community questions here, more than I thought we would. So uh, okay, let's cool. quickly go through that because um, I don't want us to run out of time. Uh, all right, so the first one is for the uninitiated, how would you define creative coding and what does creative coding mean to you? Oh, wow. Um, creative coding. I, I, my, my quick, my quick thing. My cool. Um, yeah, my, my, my quick explanation for, for, I guess, like my, like, like aunts and uncles is like, it's just making art with code, um, you know, and that is, uh, that is, you know, can be as simple as like, oh, I made a, made a website and use CSS to arrange the things in an artistic way. Or it could be, you know, like writing like sophisticated JavaScript code to, to position things and, and arrange, yeah, make it interactive, maybe, maybe use, use an API. But yeah, I, I try not to be too rigid with it and just say like, you know, if you, if you typed something into a text editor and, and now it's running and you feel like driven by that, or do you feel like artistically like, like satisfied by that? That's, that's creative coding in my eyes. I guess, yeah, it's an interesting word now that I think about it because creative coding could mean you're, you're coding in a creative way or you're just coding, but you're, you're creating something with code. Um, and it sounds like you're closer to the latter where as long as you're creating something with code, you're creative coding. For sure. For sure. Um, all right, and I've got some questions from Ben. Um, what do you do when you hit a creative block? Um, I, I do like to, to breathe. Um, and go on a walk. Um, yeah, <laughs> honestly, it's, it's just that. I like breathe, go on a walk. Uh, maybe sometimes I jump rope, but um, yeah, definitely I, I, I try not to, to use too much resistance when, when I have creative block because I think it's, it's, a, it's a signal. Um, so I, I usually interpret that signal as, you know, you need a break. Mm. Yeah, that's a good, that's a, sounds like a healthy way to do it. Um, what is the best pun you've heard with your last name having GUI in it, G-U-I? <laughs> that never even occurred to me. <laughs> yeah, uh, see, I don't know. I think it, I, I think it was like my, in high school, the like computer teacher and uh, just but just say my name as cat cat and gui um yeah i think that was basically it. i don't know if it was the best pun but that's the most memorable one it's like a, a cat in a gui <laughs> yeah that's about it yeah definitely a kind of thing that would only come up in a computer course or a computer class yeah. uh yeah. let's see and uh one from reed do you think coders see and read english differently than the rest of us are you a native english speaker i guess that might uh, be also important I am a native English speaker. Um, hmm. Not sure, but I, I, I think the answer is probably yes. Um, actually, um, there's, there's, I think there, I mean, that's probably a, a big tenet of like the school for poetic computation is that we're using language um, in a way to communicate with computers and express things. But I think, you know, we can also, we can also, um, use code to analyze language in, in, in interesting ways. I think, uh, uh, one, uh, good friend of mine, Yelly, um, made, made, a, a project called the gendered project where, uh, she, um, uh, took, took an API and looked at all of like the, the words in the English dictionary and picked out which ones were gendered, like saying like, okay, like for one example is like, okay, you look at all the, the, the definitions and if, see if they contain the words like he, him, hers, um, she, like all these, all these things, um, 
or, or a woman. And so like one big example is like, okay, like if you look at the word master, it's like, oh, you have mastery over something. And it's like, oh, if you have, if you have great skill, but then the, you know, the gendered like mirror of the word master is mistress, but of course it has like very different connotations. Um, so I, yeah, I think, it, so there's, yeah, the, the, I mean, just the automation of that is, is, is very interesting to look at language. One but, thing, yeah. one, like to answer that same question, one thing that kind of comes up in my life is the literalness of it, um, of how when you're, when you're coding um, and people like give you an instruction in the real world, um, a lot of times, like this is just me, but like it seems like there's a lot of like implicitness or like, um, yeah, just a lot of that's unsaid. And sometimes, you know, if it's if it's like a task that I've done before or whatever, it's not a big deal. But a lot of times, like this is a, a source of conflict between me and my wife, it's like, like I didn't fully understand what you meant because you assumed that I would know what you meant. And um, then she calls me a computer, blah, blah, blah. Um, but I think that might be an affectation that more than just uh, me, uh, like other coders might also have. I, I, there's probably just overlap of that, with like that purity too. of, yeah. Uh, I think, yeah, the, the profession kind of forces you to be very specific and not other not a lot of other jobs have that baked in mm. uh okay so let's see um ben also asks what are your favorite mediums to work with i mean code of course um yeah that makes sense but um yeah i guess i guess maybe maybe not quite a medium um maybe more of a technique i really um really love and admire collage um i i, I have this same appreciation for um for typography um yeah I, I i don't consider myself experts in either collage or typography but i think those are those are two um really big sources of inspiration both like conceptually and just like in terms of what they produce and you got into collage if i remember correctly like uh working on a freelance gig or a side project uh yeah 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 um yeah, yeah for an artist um i was actually uh really inspired by um uh i spider-man into the spider-verse um and, and like how how they how they kind of used a lot um a lot of everything was like every frame could have been like an individual picture um and i thought yeah. that was really interesting and I, I felt like you know collage was a very um very uh good medium to kind of attach to that to that concept um but also it was just like it was what worked for the client because they have a lot of photographs um so yeah that's that's kind of where i i developed an appreciation for it that's super cool uh okay so winnie asks how do you bridge the sandbox processing paradigm which i assume is the same as p5 uh into actually bridging stuff into production on the web okay i get that and um does it frustrating you that does it frustrate you that people associate creative coding with processing like stuff like i just mm. did in p5 <laughs> um i i don't know if it frustrates me um but i, I think it, it, it it's an opportunity to say like it can be anything um yeah it, it, i think uh you know if, if people only associate creative coding with with processing type of stuff i think that you know, has a potentially exclusionary effect. Um, I, I, yeah, in, in my class, I, I tried to really communicate that uh, creative coding, or I think like computation is a kind of a way of thinking. Um, you don't necessarily to need to um, have yeah, open processing. Um, so there was one, I, there was one project that I shared in my class where, you know, someone just defined a rule set and like rolled dice and like, okay, whenever the dice like um, ends up at this number, I'm going to draw this part of a tree. Um, and so they, they just roll the dice over and over again and then end up with like a, like a randomly drawn tree. Um, and I, I share that example because it's like, yeah, you're, you're thinking computationally, you have a rule set, you're thinking um, in a way that mirrors uh, creative coding, um, but yeah, you don't have to write the code that way. Um, yeah, so it, it maybe maybe it could frustrate me a little bit, but yeah, I, I, I hope people can see that there's a much, much bigger world beyond, um, yeah, like creative coding, uh, in, like the processing world. Um, and in terms of bridging sandboxed uh, processing paradigm into the into production, um, it's hard. <laughs> um, I, I find that it's, it's never as easy as it should be. Um, yeah, there's so many times where I would like 
I started a sketch. Um, yeah, but there's there's just it's it's ends up being just like a lot of CSS and like you know thinking about your specific like um, specific company or client's setup. Um, so there's a lot of considerations to be made there. Um, and yeah, and I I oftentimes get a lot of help. Um, in, in my creative coding project or in, in that client project where I'm working with collage, um, for, for a rapper. Um, yeah, my, the process was like, okay, I'm going to make, I'm going to make this one in glitch. I'm going to make this animation in glitch. And then I handed it off to a friend, a collaborator who would get all into the front end architecture and just make it into something that makes sense. Um, so yeah, the answer is I, I, I find it hard to think about, um, and I usually get a lot of help. Yeah, that makes it when you when you kind of think of thinking uh, when you think of putting things into production, do you associate it with like React, Vue, like like modern web frameworks? Yeah, yeah. Mm. That makes yeah. sense. They're not um, yeah, they're not necessarily built around a lot of that purpose. Yeah, for sure. So it's I mean, maybe with React three fiber, I've never touched it, but it seems it seems like something that would be easier. But yeah, I just don't really know about it. Yeah, it makes sense, especially with, yeah, there's like always a new thing every every week. Uh, so yeah, it's hard to keep keep up with it in addition to being into, you know, like if that's not your primary focus. Uh, okay, cool. Um, and let's see, Ben asks, how do you keep balanced, up to date and honed in with your craft? Which I guess can I connect with what I just said? Yeah, um, how, how do I? <laughs> I mean, yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's always just trying to trying to be aware of my body. Like, um, I think uh, I think being on, being on a computer and a phone can has a potential to be a very like disembodying experience. You kind of just realize that you've been in a chair for a few hours. Um, so uh, yeah, I always try to just really take care of take care of my, my my overall fitness and and breathe and do all these stretches and stuff um there's actually one moment where I, that i kind of had a reckoning with this like shortly after shortly after um after school um and like when i was like job hunting and doing freelance work um i started getting really bad carpal tunnel syndrome like like symptoms um mm -hmm. and i like went to physical therapist and all this and like i was getting ergonomic keyboards and ergonomic like mice and stuff um and my, my, my PT like said like, you know, you can, you can buy the nicest running shoes, but if you run too much, it's just going to hurt. <laughs> so, um, that, that's definitely really stuck to me. And so like, um, yeah, taking breaks and just not doing it too much, um, is, is how I try and try and maintain, uh, and keep well balanced. Um, yeah, absolutely. I guess, yeah, this is, I guess that's, that's one aspect of it. Like keep like, keeping up with the craft, but like being up to date, um, I, I actually, I don't, I don't know. I, I, I have very few thoughts on, on like the newest things. Um, so I, I guess I do try and keep up to date, but maybe, um, on a good like six month lag, uh, behind, <laughs> behind the trend, because, um, I find it hard to I find it just like too stressful, um, to stay up to date when, when people are debating the merits of this thing or that thing so i just try and wait it out relatedly are you do you use, you mentioned hacker news earlier like in terms of how you kind of got into this world but do you um check into hacker news like every day or are you an occasional viewer uh probably more occasional these days um yeah, uh, i'll, I'll I'll open it and just like look at everything and then try and not click things, um, yeah. like unless yeah, unless something really there. really speaks to me. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm. I, I would say, hmm, where am I? I mean, Twitter. Twitter was like probably the 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 biggest source of just knowing what people are up to. Um, but yeah, uh, right now, given the state of Twitter, I don't I don't know I, I don't know how I'm how I'm staying up to date. Um, I guess it's just kind of by luck and happenstance, but um, yeah, yeah, I don't really have a good answer for how I have to stay up to date now. Yeah, for me, I find it's like a mix of many things. Like I don't know that it, how to stay up to date, but I know that I'm sort of up to date. Um, but again, yeah, like like taking that six month buffer zone like removes a lot of the noise from from the equation. But I think for me, it's like there's like a couple newsletters that I follow, uh, yeah. a bunch of blog RSS things. Uh, yeah, and the occasional Twitter, and it all kind of combines, and now I've got a picture. Yeah, yeah, uh, for sure. But yeah, for me, I'm rarely on the bleeding edge. I like to, like, 
use the things I know and push them really far until I need to go further. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so in a world where e-ink, e-paper, foldable screens are becoming feasible, um, what app would you make that marries the joy of pen and paper and the interactive possibilities of digital mediums? Ooh, I don't That's know. I I don't yeah, that's a hard know. question. It is a hard question. I mean, I, 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 I've never used one of those remarkable tablets um, with the e-ink, like, in, like, a stylus. They look really cool. I mean, that, that seems like something that I would definitely want. Um, but, yeah, I haven't, haven't gotten around to trying one. Um, I, I, yeah, I would, I would love... Um, <laughs> I would love for something like this to exist. Um, yeah, uh, I think... Uh, <laughs> The other side of that world, I think my understanding um, from talking to the folks at Readwise is the Remarkable came out and it kind of spurred this huge like industry of imitators. And there's like, I think there's Books and a couple others that are essentially e-ink Android phones, uh, but without the phone part. Um, and there's been like a lot of like grassroots um, imitation, but also maybe some innovation there in terms of how do we read when we're not beholden to the Kindle store? And, you know, how do we make notes when you know, in, in open and easy to access ways. Uh, but right now uh, in e-ink Android world, it just seems like how do we make this useful in the conventional ways we're ready? Like nobody's really trying to do anything different. I think Remarkable does a great job of that because they're, you know, more motivated to um, as a private company with designers and all the rest of it. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I don't know if anyone's really cracked the nut because, um, uh it's it's drawing and it's keyboarding um so far and note taking like uh annotations highlighting um but i yeah i definitely think there's something more there uh and i mean color e-ink is apparently a prototype thing and that could be huge um, um but yeah i think that's a really intriguing technology yeah uh, i'll i'll be waiting on the edge of my seat <laughs> yeah same uh okay and so ola asked and also kind of connected to some previous stuff about sfpc is um, could you give us an overview of like the algorithmic botany that you teach and L trees and all the rest of it? And why, why are trees so commonly used as the example of creative coding? Cause I've seen this a lot and it seems like yeah. there's something intriguing about botany and trees and organic shapes, making organic shapes with computers and generating them. Yeah, for sure. I mean, so like when you hear the algorithmic botany, like I think what draws a lot of people to it is like this almost contradiction, uh, this tension of sorts um, that, you know, you know, we, we, we always think about like nature as the absence of technology and we, we got to go back and these things. And so uh, what I, what I try to do with this class is, is really present a way that like technology can bring us closer to nature and foster deeper understanding. Um, and then perhaps maybe plants were the, are, are the earth's oldest computers. Um, in, in, in some way. Uh, so those are some like big ideas that we, we, we try to step towards uh, by learning um, a set of uh, algorithmic or, or, or botanical algorithms. Uh, the first one, like you mentioned, is L systems. It stands for L Linden Meyer systems, but basically just drawing, drawing trees um, by utilizing some like string replacement and generating a string and then rendering, uh, interpreting um, that string into a, a tree structure. Um, another one was um, was phylotaxis, um, which is uh, just the kind of the golden ratio spiral like, appearance of of like flower like like flower seeds in a, sun, in a sunflower, or um, maybe like the, the leaves of a succulent kind of golden ratioing around around um, the center. Um, and that that's, you know, I think there's a whole genre of YouTube video that talks about golden ratio stuff um, and gets people excited about math. So that's our intro one um, and immediately like gratifying. Um, and then we also uh, go into a cellular automata, um, which is, if, if trees are kind of like the macro and thinking and thinking large, um, uh, cellular automata is kind of trying to think about it in terms of the micro and um, perhaps, uh, so I, 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 com I combine it with some readings about like fungal uh, growths and mushrooms and, and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, uh, that's, that's kind of, that's kind of the, the sequencing of, of algorithms. But yeah, like I said, I always try and pair, pair learning the algorithms with um, 
with um, some readings. Um, and to, to your point about what, you know, why trees always come up, um, I, there was a very excellent um, article that I've, I've read several times um, uh, called Tree Thinking by uh, Shannon Mattern. Um, yeah, so uh, Shannon was, was super generous with, with her time and agreed to be with me um, before I, before I uh, taught the class. Um, but yeah, um, and we had an excellent conversation, but uh, tree, tree thinking is, is, is really um, a, a, a huge inspiration. Um, uh, basically, it walks through like how we have, you know, the tree of life, the tree of knowledge, like in, in the Bible and basically in and basically like all religions, um, they have some big event at, at a tree. Um, but then uh, going forward into today, we have we have like decision trees and random trees. Um, um, and yeah, it's it, there's there's in the in this in this article, uh, she goes into this really long like anthropological uh, history of how how we've always thought of trees as like like knowledge and 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 data and you know literally paper paper comes from trees and so we're just like storing we're storing information human information in in the in these trees um yeah um but uh tree thinking is the name of the article shannon madden is the is the, the name, name of the author um highly recommend Sweet. Yeah, I found that and I linked it in the space. So I'm going to definitely take a look at that. It looks really cool uh, from the skimming that I did. Uh, all right. And I guess on this, if there's another community question that I missed, definitely let me know. Ping me in the Discord chat. Um, but uh, for now, I guess we can end with uh, what does the future of creative software and creative coding look like? Oh, man, I don't know. Um... I, I really like, I really like this. I don't know if it's a trend, but there's there's a lot of people just kind of thinking low tech, um, trying to accomplish things with like the least amount of tech possible, um, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's just exercising some restraint, and I think that signals some kind of maturation of of the um, of the medium. Um, but at the same time, like. I, I used chat GBT to help me write um, some regular expressions <laughs> uh, because I wasn't going to do that myself. Um, so maybe some combination of, of both. Uh, when you say with the least amount of tech possible for low tech, do you mean like libraries and frameworks or do you mean something something broader or bigger? Uh, my first thought is libraries and frameworks, but I'm, gotcha. I'm sure there's a deeper way to interpret that. Uh, but for now, like, yeah. Good old, yeah. Good old JavaScript the reason I asked is, is, is it kind of reminded me of like there are projects where people have um, made like web servers and websites that are like solar powered or that shut off when it's nighttime yeah. and things like that. Where it, it feels like there's, you know, like we've we've kind of gone back to or at least some of us have gone back to self-hosting our own little Raspberry Pi servers on the internet. Yeah, which absolutely. Is cool. I love that. Love that a lot. Yeah, same. Cool. Um, yeah, and I guess that is a great place to talk or to end. Uh, thanks, Sean, for coming, and thanks for answering uh, all of our community questions, and thanks everyone in the community for asking those questions. Um, I guess it's a good place to end. Yeah, thanks so much. Right. Thank you. It's, it's been excellent. Yeah, love Canopio, and yeah, I pre appreciate you inviting me to talk. Hey, thanks. It's my Thank pleasure. You. Cool. All Take right. care, y'all. Peace. See ya. Bye. All right. Do we have any outstanding bits of business? I guess the recording will, will end soon, and so will this Discord chat. Um,